Aries and a farmer. <laughs> Aries is first. <laughs> That's for sure. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, it is, I believe, what, the third Friday of the month, which means it's time for The Doctor Is In, a Q&A that you submit the questions for in advance for Dr. Ron Weiss. Please welcome him to the show. How are things in New Jersey? Oh, they're very green. Especially after we, you know, we've had a terrible drought here, Chef AJ. Hasn't rained all spring, which is uh, very unusual for New Jersey. And it's finally raining. So we're, we're grateful today. It's raining in June. Go figure. Here, right. it's, it's been in the 90s. Well, good. Well, you're, you're a farmer also, not just a doctor. It's, no, it's critical because we weren't doing well. You know, we, New Jersey gets about 60 inches of rain a year on average. And we're in a special valley in northern New Jersey. It gets 70 inches of rain. It's the rainiest part of New Jersey, and we haven't had a drop. So this is very welcome. Wow. Well, that's great. You know, you're starting to come up and getting some of the more questions than just about anybody else now. So, you know, we could do this every day and you probably still get questions and people are saying, I love this doc. Well, he can be your doc too, because not only practices in New Jersey, but you see people virtually in every state or just New Jersey and New York. Uh, Yes. From all over. Great. All All right. Well, you know, let's jump right into the questions. The first one is controversial boy in the plant-based world. So we may as well get it over with now. It's regardless of what it is. Okay, tell me, what do you think it is? Omega-3s. Oh, my God. You are not only a genius, you're a psychic. You're yes. absolutely right. Because, you know, this comes up a lot. I had my omega-3 tested by Omega Quant, and it came back as 5%. My wife's was quite low at 3.2%. We both follow a whole food plant-based diet. Can you please talk about the dangers of a low omega-3 index and what level you recommend? Also, my 5% index is from four tablespoons of flax and chia seeds daily and no algae supplements. Thank you. I'm just getting weak thinking about how I'm going to answer this because (laughs) there are many, there's a, oh, a whole book could be written on this topic. So uh, just to let you know, and you know this, Chef AJ, that there's been some real dust ups, right? In the plant-based world between our the leaders of our, uh, of our movement, some of them believe in omega-3 supplementation and some don't. And- um, you So know, you gotta be Switzerland here. You gotta be- Yeah, we gotta be Switzerland. <laughs> so it's not to offend anyone, but I'm gonna give you my, I'm sort of a pragmatist, because I'm a primary care doctor. So primary care is where the rubber meets the road, right? It's where you're dealing with, I'm, I'm not only looking at black numbers on a white page and charts and uh, studies and data, I'm also looking at living patients. So that's really valuable. So let me just give a little background. Um, for those of you who are not not, uh, very familiar with this subject. Omega-3 essential fatty acid, two kinds, short chains and long chains. These are really, really important fats. If you notice in the name, it says essential, which means that if we didn't take them in, we would die because we can't make them. Guess what? Our brain, one third of the dry weight mass of the brain, if you weigh it, is omega-3s, Chef AJ. One third, if you weigh it, that's how much omega-3 takes up of our brain. It is critical for brain function. We need the omega-3s. So, We know that it's important to grow brains. For example, when a fetus is developing in a mommy, the brains continue to grow from the time you're born until the time you're 25, where on average the brain stops growing and then it starts shrinking inside, in size 
until you're in the cemetery. Uh, you know, that's just the way life works. Um, we've noticed there is some evidence that people who are have lower levels of omega-3s, especially as they get older, in other words, in their senior years, if they're given, if they're supplemented with the omega-3s, two things have been demonstrated to happen. Number one, they do better when we give them executive cognitive function tests. If we give them problems to figure out, they can do better on the test when we give them the supplementation. Get ready for this. When we got CAT scans on people's brains and saw they were shrunken, which by the way, is one of the definitive, um, I can't say definitive, but it's, it is the, one of the main criteria to diagnose someone with Alzheimer's. You have to get a brain scan and you see their brain is shrunken. It's called atrophy. When we took patients with atrophied brains in these studies, and they were seen to be low in omega-3s, and they were supplemented, guess what happened? Their brains expanded inside. They got larger. So from these kinds of studies, uh, it's very powerful to, to think about what kind of positive effect omega-3 supplementation may have on both function and the anatomy of these older brains. And it's been extrapolated that a level of 5.5% on the omega check, it's, it's basically, I don't wanna get lost in the weeds here, but it's a lab value you can get from a lab, which is a ratio, don't, don't get lost now, but it's a ratio of, of long chain omega threes over omega sixes. Sixes, if you remember, are pro-inflammatory. Threes are anti-inflammatory. You always want as many threes as possible and some amount of six, but not many, because remember sixes, we need them too. So in general, by eating things like flaxseed, ground up, I recommend two tablespoons a day, but not more. Extra chia seeds, like maybe a tablespoon or two a day. Ground is important for the chia seed too, because grinding the chia seed doubles the circulating amount of the omega-3s. Let me back step one second. The types of, I began by saying, there are two types of omega-3, short and long chains. Your brain is built out of the long chains. It wants the long chains. The problem is the eating of plants, we only get the short chain. Those are in the flax and the chia and the walnuts and to a very small degree, some greens and winter squashes. So in any event, your body can under you know, rickety situations can take the short chains and convert them into the long chains so your brain can use them. But it's a, it's sort of, as I said, a feeble process. It's very rickety. Sometimes as we get older, it doesn't work that well. Maybe genetically, some of us are not really that capable of doing that. And because of that, that's why, for example, Dr. Furman, who is one of my mentors and a mentor for many of us has recommended uh, that we take omega-3 supplements. Here's what I've noticed. I've noticed that, get ready for this chef AJ. This is why I say I'm between Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Furman. You know, Dr. Esselstyn is not so crazy about nuts, right? He's not nuts about nuts. Either is Dr. McDougall, right? Nuts are for kings. The thing about nuts and many seeds is that they have a high level of omega-6s. 
which will knock down your omega check three to six ratio if you eat too many of them. And I have noticed that to be the case. When we have patients eating a lot of nuts and seeds, especially things like peanuts and almonds and you know, uh, pumpkin seeds, all kinds of things that have a lot of omega-6s, their omega-3 ratio goes down. And so you would end up with a lower number on that omega check. And I've noticed when we take those seeds and nuts away from patients, the ones that have high sixes, now that's not walnuts, but they're the other nuts and seeds. When we remove those from the diet and we just supplement them with the, the patients with the flax ground and the chia ground, the majority of them can rise, these patients, from low levels on this omega-3 check of like the kind this patient is talking about, maybe three or definitely five, they can go to be six. I've seen it go to be seven. I've seen it eight and nine. So to be clear to the audience, on this omega check blood test, do you want the, the reference range says to get the optimal result in brain health, you want to be over five and a half percent. So definitely, I agree. I, I, I've seen in my patients, and what I usually will do is when the patients come in, I get an omega blood test on them in the beginning of the year. And if it's low, I'll tell them to avoid all seeds and nuts other than the flax, the chia, and maybe some walnuts, depending on who you are in small amount. And then I see their omega checks rise throughout the year. And oftentimes they'll become normal. And then if they become really good, like six or five, six or six and a half, what I'll do is I'll begin to reintroduce some of these other high omega-6 nuts and seeds in small amounts to their diet. And in that way, we don't have to take the omega-3 supplement. However, I've noticed in some patients we do, because I, even with the flax and even with the chia every day, I can't get, and, and with the abstinence or the avoidance of the high six containing nuts and seeds, I still can't get them up, uh, their omega numbers. And I think this may be because of something Dr. Furman has commented on. He thinks that perhaps a quarter of the population just may not have the physiologic uh, mechanism uh, to convert the plant omega short chain threes into the long chain, and they need extra help. Um, Dr. Furman has also alluded to the fact that in his life, and remember, Dr. Furman has a lot of valuable experience because he has been a practicing primary care doctor for many years. He has taken primary care of many, many, many patients, and he's taken care of them, witnessed their diseases, witness them over decades and decades and decades of what happens to them. And many of the people he's taken care of in the be beginning, many of his mentors who got him started on eating plants, they died of degenerative neurologic diseases like dementia, like Parkinson's disease. So that was very concerning to him. And it certainly is concerning to me to hear that. And it's certainly concerning when I check these values to see, especially in people who are not eating fish, that these values of omega-3s tend to be quite low. Sometimes I've seen like less than two in vegans. So because of all these reasons, that's the way I, I roll. Just to summarize, I would have your doctor check. Uh, I my, The lab I use is LabCorp, it's a large national lab, and they have this trademark test called an omega check, and it is a, an omega three to six ratio. 
And that's what I do. I send the patient there, they get a check. You want it to be above five and a half percent. If it's less than that, I would recommend e eating flaxseed ground, two tablespoons, chia, maybe two tablespoons ground for a year, because it takes a long time to change these values and maybe stay away from the other seeds and nuts except for some walnuts. And then see what it is in another year. And if it goes above five and a half percent, there you go. You accomplished your goal. If it doesn't, I think I would recommend the omega-3 supplements, but not from fish oil because our oceans need a break and you don't want the poisons from fish. Just get it from green algae oil. Right. Was that too complex? No, uh, I think I think, myself. I think you did great. I'm going to listen to it again. You know, I've been able to keep mine up without nuts and seeds just by eating a lot of greens, but I get it checked every yeah, year. Most people can. Yeah. But some can. Right. Of course. And so, but do you agree, Dr. Weiss, that the test should be venipuncture and not the finger stick? Because I've had doctors say that the, the finger stick is just not a, as accurate in general. Yeah. You have to remember, you know, I, I don't like finger stick blood tests because uh, they're run on simplified machines, these finger sticks. The, the vast and complex machines that are in large laboratories that take whole blood, these blood samples, that's a whole different kind of technology. And, you know, it's standardized. It's, I, I prefer the blood test from the veins. Thank you. I appreciate that. So here's a question I don't think we've had from Kimberly. It's about hyperhidrosis. Her son has excessive sweating, not related to heat or exercise. Is there anything that can be done to reduce sweating that doesn't require medications? Yeah, this is a tough one. I have to begin by saying that. Hyperhidrosis, there, there are some people who have overactive sweat glands. and. Um, the common places for this uh, overactivity to be, be is the palms of the hand. I don't know if any of you ever, sh if anyone is not aware of this condition, sometimes you'll shake hands with someone and their hand is very wet. Um, so that person has hyperhidrosis. Also, it occurs in the armpits, medically known as the axillae, and the feet, very commonly. Feet are sweaty. So, and this is regardless of temperature, regardless of time of year, uh, you know, maybe being nervous makes it even worse, but even if you're calm, you're sweating. So, uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, this is a, they, they do make drugs to, to help with this condition, but I've had patients on the drugs and you know, they're not really that effective. Uh, perhaps even injection of Botox has been bandied about, but I've not seen that to really be effective. And, you know, uh, I've had patients who tried to use uh, um, deodorants that have uh, desiccating agents in it, which, are, which is basically aluminum aluminum salts, but, uh, and they can be somewhat effective, but I would highly advise against that because there is some evidence that this aluminum is absorbed into your body. And there is some suspicion that it could increase risk of breast cancer if you're a woman and perhaps even be absorbed into your brain and then be the beginning, uh, the nidus or the provocative uh, initiation of Alzheimer's tangles in your brain. So I try to get people away from aluminum. So other than those suggestions, uh, unfortunately at this time, there's really not a lot. I know it's a very difficult problem. You know, it can be somewhat embarrassing, you know, if you're sweating a lot. But um, at this time, there really are no, no good, good uh, remedies that I'm aware of. Oh, thank you. This is about kidney stones, and it's from Valeria. She asks, 
a few, you could give some advice. Her husband just discovered he has kidney stones. What can we do in the future in terms of lifestyle choices to help him prevent the formation of new stones? We've been vegan for nine years now. He eats vegan processed food, not too junky, but not wholly unprocessed either. Thank you for the suggestions. Well, so kidney stones are very common in the American public. And um, 80 percent of the stones roughly are made out of calcium oxalate. And then uh, some of the, the stones are made out of cysteine, which is another mineral. Some can be made out of uric acid. Some can be made out of this pyrophos triple phosphate. There are other minor kinds of stones, but I'm going to be, assume that this lady is talking about the most common kind of stone, which is calcium oxalate. That's the kind of mineral that is most common. And the reason why it's important to talk about the kind of mineral is because um, we have to be careful about what we eat because uh, a lot of plant foods contain oxalates in them. And the first thing, uh, when we see a patient, well, let me back up a little bit. The first thing I would tell anyone who has a kidney stone is try to get the kidney stone. So in other words, if you're peeing, you have a kidney stone, you use a strainer. Uh, it's like a little sieve, a fine mesh sieve, and you pee through it. And then if the tiny little grain or tiny pebble falls out, while you're urinating, then you send your doctor will send it to a lab for analysis, and that will give you the diagnosis of what the mineral makeup of the stone is. So assuming you do that and it's calcium oxalate, what I tell the patients is uh, the first step is eating a plant-based diet. We've seen there is evidence that eating animal proteins can increase your risk of having the stones. So not eating animal proteins is number one. But then I still have some plant-based whole foods patients who are still getting stones. And what I learned was that that was because the vast majority of them are eating too many plants that have too high an oxalate level. In them. And, you know, these, these particular patients, it's not a problem for everyone, but for a good number of people, it is. If they eat things like spinach, beet greens, rhubarb, um, believe it or not, Chef AJ, uh, you know, beans, some nuts have oxalates in it. Sweet potatoes, I know you love sweet potatoes. That can have oxalates in it. So there are foods that we commonly eat as whole food plant-based people that do have oxalates in it. So what I do is I'll give them an oxalate food list. And you can look this up on the internet. Say lit, Google list of high oxalate foods. And basically when you get to this list, well, oh, did you ever taste sorrel? You know what sorrel is? Sourgrass. Yeah, it's an herb. It's an herb. Yeah. Like I'm Jewish and my relatives from Eastern Europe, my grandfather used to make a dish called shav, which is a soup made out of sorrel or sour grass. It's Polish, like Eastern Russian, um, Western Russian dish. And so that is very high in oxalates. So you get a list of, don't eat that. <laughs> uh, I would definitely, if you have kidney stones, I would definitely stay away from spinach because spinach is number one on the hit list. And then things like the sorrel or the sour grass is like number two or three, the beet greens is up there. Don't go near those things. You know, they're fairly minor green. Well, spinach is a major green, it's very common, but I would just stay away from it because there's so many other greens to eat that don't have oxalate, high oxalates in them. And basically you don't need spinach to live. And if you eat just even like a cup and a half of spinach a day, which is not a lot, Chef AJ, that's going to toss your oxalate level over. So I tell my patients to spend their oxalate bucks on the most valuable and necessary of whole plant foods. And guess what that is? The legumes. 
the legumes, because I, if I had to center, because they're really important. So um, spend your oxalate bucks there. Um, and there are plenty of greens you can eat other than beet greens and spinach and, and sorrel that don't have high oxalates. And then, you know, then you don't have to worry about anything. Here's what I also do. I also get a before and after 24 hour urine test to measure how much oxalates they have, because you can do that. So I'll get, I'll get the, I'll take all the urine in a 24 hour period when they're eating their before diet and see usually somebody who has kidney stones, they're over the limit for oxalate measurements in their 24 hour urine. And then when I put them on the, the diet, I'll make sure that it's within normal range. And then we know we're good to go. That we know that they're eating a good amount, healthy, low amount of oxalate. So that's the way that goes. And then once the oxalate level in the urine is under the normal range, the mineral will not precipitate out in the urine and form into rocks, which will give you the kidney stone. Last thing I'm gonna say, you know why I like beans so much uh, for, the, for the oxalate bucks and the dark leafy greens? Because they're also very high in calcium. And here's what we, if you notice, I told you in the beginning that these stones are made out of calcium oxalate, right? The calcium has to get together with the oxalate in your urine. So your kidney pees out oxalate mineral, it pees out calcium mineral, and then all of a sudden, the calcium and the oxalate find each other in your urine, come together and form a crystal, then the crystals find each other and form rocks. But how about this? How about if we ate a lot of calcium from dark leafy greens and beans, and then if we ate the even a high amount of oxalates. And if this reaction went together in your gut before the separate oxalate and calcium was absorbed into your body, then you don't have to worry. The calcium and oxalate would be bound together, form crystals in your gut, and you just poop them out. It wouldn't be absorbed. And that's why we think, that's why I always suggest the patients to eat the beans because they do have oxalate, but they have a lot of calcium and put them together with greens. The dark leafy greens, like the collards and the kale, they have a lot of calcium. These should be in your stomach and intestine at the same time. And I have to tell you, in all the years I've been practicing, I've had patients with kidney stones before, but never after eating like this. Wow, that's great. Yeah. I love that. How to spend your oxalate bucks. I never yeah. heard that before. Oxalate bucks. Okay, well, now we're going to switch gears and talk about ticks. And guys, I'm sorry I can't take questions from the chat. We have questions all the way back from February that we're still trying to get answered. So please uh, sign up at chefaj.com. We'll send you an email once a week with the guest lineup, and then you can respond to it. So this is from Loretta. And she said, you had once touched on a Lyme disease on this show. And in the event I get bitten by a tick, what should I do? Save the tick? When do you seek medical attention? I live in Alabama and it's not unusual that I get bit once a year. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I live in Morris County, New Jersey. Morris County, New Jersey, I think this year or in a recent year, and maybe still, is the highest Lyme disease incidence county in the United States. I, I can't guarantee you it's this year, but it has been in recent years. I'll have to look it up and get, get an update on that. There is not almost no one I know who hasn't had Lyme disease in our town and county. So I know what your concern is. I understand it. Chef AJ, do you know why? Why, does all, why is everyone beset by all these tick-borne diseases? Do you know why? No. Mm -mm. Like, did this happen when we were kids? I don't, I don't remember. remember this. I don't remember. It's never here. You know, oddly enough, you know, we didn't have the test 
I think the first Lyme disease case was diagnosed in Lyme, Connecticut. That's why it was called that, like in the 70s, late 60s, 70s. So I guess maybe people were sick. We didn't know it, but it's epidemic now. <clears throat> I'm just going to put this out there. The reason for this is because we have violated the rights of nature. That's why tick-borne diseases are, are our exploding in incidents. Um, it is because we human beings have corrupted ecosystems in the natural world. Um, Chef AJ, um, two years ago, um, I was um, going for a, a physical for my hospital, my on staff privileges. Uh, my nurse practitioner took my pulse. It was irregular. Next thing I know, I'm getting an EKG. I'm missing heartbeats. I end up in the emergency room the next day. Uh, my heart rate was at 30 some odd beats and I was in heart block from Lyme disease. I had cardiac Lyme. So it was in my heart. I had no other symptoms. And I otherwise, I wouldn't know. And I got that from a, a, a tick bite. So I'm fine now. They gave me antibiotics and they saved my life. So I don't fool around with tick bites. If you are in a, if you are in a endemic area for Lyme disease, um, and I'm not sure, I don't think Alabama is that. I'm not, forgive my ignorance, but I'm not that familiar with the, the, with the tick-borne illness uh, prevalence in Alabama, but you can look on a map. If, if you are in a Lyme disease uh, prevalent area, it is recommended that uh, if the tick has been on you for some period of time, and I would say that period of time is more than let's say six hours or eight hours or 10 hours. I wouldn't wait 24 hours. And if you are, if you've gotten it before 72 hours, you can take a prophylactic dose of doxycycline, 200 milligrams, just two little capsules and be done with it. And that is highly preventative and effective in preventing Lyme disease. Of course, I'd just like to remind the listeners, there are a lot of other kinds of tick-borne illnesses now, things like anaplasmosis, Babesia, um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So, and these are rising in incidence too. Uh, so in any event, I know that probably wasn't a very direct um, direct response to this lady's answer. You really, for everyone in, in heavily Lyme disease endemic areas, what you should do is, the first step is protect yourself, uh, make sure you wear the proper clothing, and you can get this all online to make sure you're covered. Um, number two, uh, make sure that you check yourself after you've been in brush or woods. Do a body check to check. The most dangerous ticks that transmit Lyme disease are nymphs. They're the size of a poppy seed. They're very difficult to see. You should check everything from your scalp, the entire body to your groin, everything. And if you find, if you find something, and it's within, you know, immediately when you come in from that area, you can remove it. And then I wouldn't do anything else. But if it's between, let's say, eight hours and 72 hours, I would take the medication to prevent Lyme disease. Wow. I don't, you know, do pets get tick bites too. They do. They can get Lyme disease. Oh, boy. Yeah. They can, a lot of times vets will put them on medication just all year round. Yep. Yeah. Oh boy. All right. Now we're going to go to inflammation. This is from MJ. 
I noticed redness and pimples on my face disappear after I started a strong regimen of ibuprofen. I'm wondering if the diet I'm eating, although it is whole food plant-based, is including something that is inflammatory and would cause these symptoms. Is there anything I can do to adjust my diet so that the symptoms stay away once I stop taking ibuprofen? Maybe you could talk about the risks of staying on a, on a, on a medication like that long-term. Yes. So uh, that's very interesting. You know, ibuprofen is an NSAID, N-S-A-I-D, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And it does have anti-inflammatory properties. And pimples, I, and I don't know what kind of pimples this lady has, but acne kind of lesions like pimples, they are, in, there is a significant inflammatory component to that. I have not had seen that in my patients that, that anti-inflammatory drugs like Advil or Lead, Motrin, Aspirin can improve acne. I've not seen that, but I find that very interesting what this lady is saying because of what I'm telling you. They're known to be anti, those lesions are known to be inflammatory and these are anti-inflammatory drugs. However, getting back to what you said, Chef AJ, um, I don't know why this lady is taking Advil, but I would try to avoid it. And the reason why is because as time goes on, uh, you know, this, when this, I guess, first came out in the 80s, maybe 70s, 80s, Advil, Motrin, Ibuprofen, it was, it was seen to be like a wonder drug. But these medications are seen it, it, to be increasingly problematic by even conventional doctors. Um, here's the two areas which we know they have serious effects in. Number one, we think they damage kidney function. And they definitely are not good for people who have underlying kidney disease. And even for those who have kidneys or normal, who, uh, there's suspicion that maybe they can cause subclinical damage, like damage that flies below the radar that we can't see to your kidney. Number two, uh, we think in the plant-based world um, and the non-conventional doctor's world that they may cause something which is called leaky gut syndrome. We think that these drugs um, like ibuprofen can punch holes in the mucus layer uh, of your gut, uh, you know, like where your gut microbiome is in the colon, and then bacteria, which are on the other side, can all of a sudden start funneling really bad molecules into your immune system and maybe start to aggravate your immune system, maybe towards, you know, I don't know, who knows, maybe the development of an autoimmune disease. We. It hasn't been figured out yet, but I would try to get off those drugs as soon as possible. Um, the other thing common I can say about what you asked is, huh, you know, there, there, there are all kinds of things that can cause acne form or pimple-like lesions, and you would need to get a proper diagnosis first. Is this true acne? Don't know. Is this rosacea? Rosacea can be, uh, look like pimples and acne. Um, alcohol uh, is a common instigator of rosacea and that looks like pimples. Are you drinking alcohol? Are you eating chocolate? Chocolate uh, can absolutely has been shown to worsen even dark chocolate, Chef AJ. And even if you're eating whole plant-based and having dark, you know, healthy cocoa or cocoa powder or chocolate, that can worsen, you know, outbreaks. So I don't know of uh, any whole plant foods per se that are known other than what I just told you to worsen eruptions. Last thing I'm going to tell you, watch out for the skin microbiome. Because I have noticed that 
It is highly disrupted by the application of personal care products, soaps, cleansers, and oftentimes when you just stop that, stop applying makeup, which I know may be tough you know, for some women to do. And if you just wash your face with water, a lot of the, it's revolutionary to see what will happen to your skin. Pimples go away, all kinds of things go away. And by the way, make sure you're not eating oil, right? Because as Dr. McDougall knows and others know, oil can give you blemishes. That's my suggestion. Right. Yeah. So even even like things that we consider maybe healthy, like you said, like dark chocolate for her particular case might not be so good. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, that's why I think an elimination diet just for a few days or a few yes. days, a few weeks could be helpful to see. Yeah. Yep. We're a faster true north. Okay. Yes. I know. I, well, that definitely will cure. Absolutely. That's the ultimate elimination diet. Okay. This is from Darlene. Uh, Dr. Weiss, I read that foods such as beans and grains may have been sprayed with a herbicide called Paraquat and that it could pose a significant health hazard to plant-based foods. There are 50 countries that have banned this, not the U.S., due to ex extreme toxicity and adverse effects on health, such as Parkinson's disease. What can we do to protect ourselves from this poison? You can eat foods that don't have poison in them. <laughs> so, there's a controversy in the plant-based world often that, um, you know, Chef AJ, plants are so powerful that even if they're grown with poison and they're served with poison in them, that they're so powerful, they can still clean out your arteries. They can still drop your blood pressure. They can still lower your blood sugars. You can still lose weight because they're so powerful. But here's my view on it. I do so much work to eat, to eat plants, to make sure they're the right plants. To, you know, I put so much effort. Why should I choose plants with a side of poison on them? These pesticides like paraquat, the one this lady is mentioning, are known to be what's called biocides. Bio means life, sides means killer. Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, the year I was born, warned us about these chemicals. And so today they blanket the earth. Uh, the EPA was founded in 72 by President Nixon based on her book, and DDT was outlawed. We still find it in every woman's breast milk, even today, who wasn't even born then because these pesticides, do, they're forever chemicals. They don't get out of our environment. So the best we can do, oh, and what I can tell you is that when we look at vegan, uh, first of all, vegan eaters, they have much, much lower levels of pesticide accumulation in their blood. Not negative, there is some, but it's much lower compared to animal eaters the animal protein eaters, you have to remember animals accumulate in their flesh and fat, all of these pesticides, they, they migrate there. So just the fact that you're eating plants, even if they're not organic plants, you'll have lower levels of toxins. But the best thing is to eat plants that are grown without poison. There are two levels of doing that. The first level, the lower level, is to get organic certified food. The, the USDA has set up a, a seal, a registration. We, on this farm, we are registered certified organic. It takes a lot of work for the farmer to do that. However, I have some news. So you could never use Paraquat. If you're, if you're getting beans that have a certified organic seal, by law, they cannot have paraquat in them. Okay? They can't have many harmful pesticides, biocides. They can have some plant-derived pesticides in them, 
Uh, and I personally don't like those, but they don't have some of the worst pesticides. Let's say, so at the very least, at least choose certified USDA organic to avoid the worst of the pesticides. And the best you can do is to buy your food from a farmer you know, who has a high level of growing. And that growing would be called regenerative. Chef AJ, if your audience is within the sound of my voice and you want to find out what this is about, I invite you to come to Farm Days, our festival on September 9th and 10th, because a lot of what we do here is not just built and the festival is not about our, our, our individual medical issues. It's about how what food extends to the health of the world at large and how food is grown. How is it regeneratively grown? How is that food for medicine, not only for the people, but food for medicine for the planet, for our rivers, for our air? So regenerative growing uses no, no killing sprays of any kind. We don't do that. And so that's what we do. So if you go to a local farmer's market, you know, I don't know where this lady's coming from. In some areas, they may have farmers that grow beans. Get to know your farmer. And that a good farmer, even if they're not certified, they'll invite you to their farmer. You can, uh, you can go and inspect the farm because he'll, he or she will be proud to show you because they do so much hard work to grow food without chemicals. Choose the food without chemicals. And we can do it. Plants without poison. Yeah. Great. Thank you. This question is from Nancy. My sister, who is vegan for five years and is controlled hypothyroid patient, says her doctor told her not to eat millet. Is that correct? Well, what, I have no, I have never, um, you know, I would say hypothyroidism is one of the most common things that diagnoses that we have in our patients. It commonly affects women after their childbearing years all the way up to, you know, limitless. Okay. And we have many patients who have to take thyroid hormones. They eat millet. We've never had any problem. And in fact, one of our favorite millets is this Kodo millet because uh, it has highly resistant starch. So what I would suggest to this lady is why don't you test out this advice? A registration. We, on this, uh, what you can do is get a blood test without eating millet and then eat millet every single day. Eat a half a cup to cup of millet every single day for like eight weeks and then get your thyroid blood test. If you don't see any difference, it means you're just missing out on a healthy grain. And a delicious one too. And a delicious one. And birds love it. I know I've got birds right. You got, I wish you could look right here what I see with all these birds eating their millet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Here's a fun question from Faith. So apparently Dr. Greger now says coffee is very healthy. And my husband had it yesterday for the first time in ages and I'm ready to pummel him. He didn't get to bed until about 2.30 a.m. and snored all night and kept me up. Please ask Dr. Weiss what he thinks. Hmm. Well, uh, um, I unless I missed something, unless I missed the memo, I, I and I, look, I, I can't pay attention to everything on the internet and everything in the world. But Why I'm, not, Doctor Weiss? <laughs> I, I'm I'm not aware that Doctor Gregor, who I respect very profoundly, has said that coffee is healthy and should be imbibed. Maybe. I know that Dr. Kim Williams has been saying that for a while. He's a cardiologist. That it is or it isn't? That it is. I mean, those of us with anxiety so, that are slow methylators, I think, oh God, I can't. So Caffeine is not a good thing. He, here's me. where well, I was talking about before, where the value of, I believe, primary care comes in. Because you take care of many, many, you take care of real people, living people with all kinds of problems. And it's the primary care doctor's responsibility to address all of them. So 
coffee, you know, people have been trying to color coffee for decades, that it causes cancer, that it that is terrible. The data is not there. I mean, uh, it, it, there are studies that show that it's beneficial. Uh, but there are also studies that show that um, in certain people, it can raise their blood pressure. In certain people, if they drink this French rose thing, it can raise their bad cholesterol. So my issue with coffee is I'm, I'm not going to go there with what the data shows as to whether it causes cancer, it prevents cancer, probably prevents cancer, to tell you the truth. Uh, um, the cholesterol, the high blood pressure. Here's my problem with coffee. There are two problems. Number one, I'm a lifestyle medicine primary care doctor. And one of the two of the seven pillars of lifestyle medicine are the domain of sleep. And absolutely, it disrupts sleep architecture. And just because it does that, I don't believe it should be drunk. And even if you eat, drink it in the morning, it has an effect on, on that evening sleep. And certainly if you drink it in the afternoon. So because of that, I don't like the patients to drink it. Number two, I believe that it interferes with your hunger signals, Chef AJ. Oh, I, I listen, Dr. Linda Carney did a fabulous presentation once, the 17 reasons why caffeine makes it hard for you to lose weight. It's, oh. it's an amphetamine. Do amphetamines make you eat more? <laughs> yes. It, it's an amphetamine. It's, an, not, it's not an amphetamine, but it has amphetamine-like properties. It speeds you up. I, I believe it, ch it changes your hunger signals. Uh, it, it, it makes you want to eat differently. And here's the last reason why I recommend people not drink coffee. It's because it's addictive. I think it makes, I not I think, I know it makes people, to, it's, an, it's a dependent, it's a substance which creates dependency for the people who drink it. If you, and, and in lifestyle medicine, we want people to be in charge of themselves, of their own domains, to be doing things because you are making the conscious decision to do it, not because coffee is making you do it. Uh, we often see when we have people doing our 30-day detox, they get horrific headaches in the first couple of days of the detox when we take them off coffee. So no, no plant or no food that, that is good for you all the way around hurts you so much when you leave it. Uh, I also came across, for those of us who are aware of um, Michael Pollan, the, the food journalist, if you go to the internet, I'm sorry, YouTube and Google, Joe Rogan, uh, Michael Pollan, coffee, Listen to this 10 or 15 minute interview with Michael Pollan. He'll tell you what happened after he cut out coffee for three months and then decided to have one cup. He said it was the most euphoric experience he's ever had, more so than the LSD and the mushrooms he'd been taking. And you know that he's, he's into those psychedelic trips. Uh, Dr. Weiss, Faith is actually watching live and actually sent me this Dr. Gregor thing. I'll, I'll just, I know you have to leave because you have to see patients, yeah. but I'll send it to you. You can look at it. You can comment. But do you think a lot of this is people just want good news about their bad habits? So Yes. If they That's like one of my favorite sayings from Dr. McDougall. People, can I imitate him? Yeah. People love to hear good news about their bad habits. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the same thing with wine or chocolate. And it's like whatever people want, they'll find a way to justify it. And I love Dr. Gregor, but I wouldn't do something just because he said it. You know, you know, I mean, that's not and you have to remember every person is their own individual there. For example, 
you know, caffeine, when you drink caffeine, it causes increased calcium excretion in your urine. Do you really want that if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia? Or if you're trying to maximize the amount of calcium in you, why would you want to be peeing it out because you drink caffeine? Right, or any kind of bladder problems or peeing at night, yeah. for example? Yeah. Yeah, I love you, Dr. Weiss. You, you tell I the- I love you too. Yeah, you know, you think about like the nat nat natural hygiene movement. I mean, it, it's not a natural thing to have coffee. Like our, th there's no coffee in nature, for example. Yeah. There's no, no wine it, in nature. There's no olive is, oil in it nature. It is a highly processed food. Yeah. I mean, there's nuts in nature. We couldn't get a lot of them. We had to open them. But there's sure. no, all I like things. the way you said, you know, it's like, just like I would say, I wouldn't, you know, um, you know, we talk about tofu, right? As being a processed food. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it's it's moderately processed, right? But, but one could that, make one could make one could make tofu. Who can really make coffee at home? Right, you can't. But and who can really make chocolate? And who can really make wine? Of course, I guess they do that in prison sometimes. Yeah. It's not necessarily wine, but you get what I'm saying. You know? Yes, I do. Well. You're awesome. Well, now listen, I know you have to go, but I just want to tell you, there's a lot of questions on ulcerative colitis. So maybe we can start with that next month. Good. Actually, oh, that's one of our specialties. Yes. Good. Perfect. Dr. Weiss, it's such a pleasure having you. It's always a pleasure, Chef. Oh, I'm so all glad. All my love to you. I'm so glad you wanted to do this. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. for Dr. Nandita Shah, all the way from India, talking about hormonal havoc and an oil-free samosa recipe and a bonus show today at two with Wanda Huberman making